uh, I, I've always felt that our ancient wisdom has at least a modicum of science. But it's important to, to as a scientist, to be able to harness that ancient wisdom, give it the correct interpretation of science, and, in, and learn how we can continue to follow those traditions in, in, in a manner of science. But it's important that we also not let go of it because increasingly we are seeing our traditions being appropriated by the West with fancy names. Uh, turmeric, which we let go and finally re-won the patent. Pranayama became uh, cardiac coherent breathing and is repackaged. It looks like that we need Western stamps to understand and, and practice Eastern traditions. So you will find me weaving the science with our ancient knowledge. And my idea is to stimulate those of you who are interested in this, that this is worth pursuing, that our traditions are worth keeping, that, that our science, there is no difference between modern science and, and ancient science. It is only a continuity of science. And much of Western science is based on Eastern tradition, whether it is the Pi, which are, whether it's the Fibonacci sequence, whether it is calculus, they have an Indian origin. With that, let me go on to this. I, I have no conflicts of interest. I mean, I'm going to do four things. Many of you have heard me talk about inflammation. I will, I, will, I, will, I will skip over it over a period of time. But I'm talking about four things. One is human evolution and why this is important. Talk about sleep and light. Talk a little about metabolic switches and, inflex and flexibility, which is where the science is going in. And lastly, what, what, what should the clinician know about this? We, uh, there are only two species that I know have, that, are, that have evolved to a point where they're very successful. One is the cockroach that can survive a, an atomic explosion. Second is us. And, and to become very successful, we have done two things. One, we gave up reproductive uh, uh, enormity to reproductive efficiency. So you'll notice we have, we have of all the uh, mammals the smallest breeds, broods rather, right? And only in one cousin of ours, which is a chimpanzee, there is even adolescence. So the presence of short, I mean, less number of children means an extended family of women take care of children. So those of you who've grown up in rural environments will remember that you probably would never have spent time with your mother, but more with your aunts and your elder sisters and all the others, right? Like elephants. In fact, uh, there are only three species in the world that survive menopause. Humans, elephants in captivity, and the okra whale. Everybody else dies at menopause. Also, some species eat their husbands after fertility, but that's different. Right? Uh, some women will relate to it even now. <laughs> but what has happened is the duration of adolescence, and now I, I heard that uh, the duration of adolescence in our home is 54 because I, I'm still mothered by my mom. Right? Our children never leave us. That helps us. By, by having maternal embrace and, and paternal uh, embrace, that has serious, that, that you know, in many ways, monogamy has uh, allowed, has allowed us to survive. That's another talk, another oration, another day, but let's talk about this. The second is the size of our brain. We have, for, for, for the amount of thing that we have, we have the largest brain. But that brain comes with a price. The brain is like the fetus, an obligate parasite of glucose. It can take a little bit of ketones, but it needs glucose to survive. And to survive, you need to adopt. How do you adopt? You're, you're not, food is not, was not guaranteed until recently. Food was not a guarantee. Which means the body had to make arrangements 
to supply glucose to the brain when food was not there. And that is the evolution of fat. We have the highest amount of fat for our body weight anywhere in the world. Not even the blubber whale has this much amount of fat. Why? Because our brain size is so huge, it needs glucose. So how do you supply fat, uh, glucose to the brain? When you don't have food, glucose is converted, it needs to go to the brain. So how do you divert it? That's insulin resistance. The, the muscle, the other tissues, stop taking up the glucose but take up fat, develop a little bit of insulin resistance, and the glucose is supplied to the brain. That's what happens in pregnancy, right? The baby is an obligate consumer of glucose. A certain amount of insulin resistance is present in pregnancy to make sure that, that all the glucose goes to the baby. So when you starve, these fat stores are depleted so that the brain can survive. Now interestingly, when do you starve? When you have stress. Therefore, there is a big relationship between and how does the body respond to any amount of stress? Whether it's your spouse shouting at you in the morning, when the servant doesn't show up, when you eat a little more, when, when there is infection, there's only one way the body responds, inflammation. So inflammation and fat are, are linked to each other by nature because one feeds on the other, right? So inflammation was started as a protective phenomenon, whether it's our gut microbiota that is involved, uh, the activation of NF-kappa-B, all of these are the body's response to an external or an internal threat. And that is intricately associated with fat. Right? So what was happening in the past was, when food was scarce, you needed fat to break down, your brain to be preserved, and inflammation was a protective phenomenon. But in the last 60 years, 70 years, we've done some amazing things. We haven't seen any other species that does so much to, do self, uh, to destroy its own self. Right? And that's our species. We decided, that, na that we don't have to live with nature, that we can dominate nature. So what did we do? We started eating more fruit, more frequent food, our quality of food changed, and our processed food became more, right? And in fact, we are the only species that eats and kills for fun. No other species does that. I've, seen, I've heard about some lions in packs that may kill progeny for fun, but, but that, those are very rare. We are the only ones who do this regularly, right? Second, we've, we've screwed up light. We have more light, we have less sleep, we have disturbed sleep, and our circadian rhythm has changed. I'll spend more time on this. Of course, we have less physical work, we have more sedentary time. We walk in the morning and then sit in a place for the rest of the day. Uh, stress is what defines us. And of course, we have less sunlight, more indoor time, less con and controlled temperatures. So let's move on on this. When a protection becomes predatory, when there's infection, starvation, and stress, there's inflammation and there's lipolysis, and the glucose is applied to the brain, some amount of ketones are produced because of uh, lipid oxidation. But insulin resistance is something that is protection. But what happens when it is there all the time? It causes other problems. For example, the body is an obligatory holder of energy. Those of us who use SGLT2 inhibitors know this. Normally, not a single drop of glucose is wasted. Why? Because you have redundant systems of reabsorbing the glucose. Right? Similarly, any amount of food co that comes is stored. In fact, I remember one of our secretaries in where, where I trained, Gayla Holly, telling us, uh, when the cake was brought for a birthday, Dr. Sishatri, this can, I can apply this directly on my hips. True. And that's why women also have, because women are more important and they have a greater Im uh, importance in maintaining the reproductive chain, you don't need men at some point of time. But you need women. And that's why they find it more difficult to lose weight because their metabolism slows down fast. 
But when fat gets accumulated, at some point of time, the body senses that there's something abnormal going on. And this particular pathway, the mTOR pathway, gets activated and you get insulin resistance inside the fat cell. When this happened, a, a, a signal is sent to the bone marrow by these molecules, by this particular inflammatory protein. Nothing to do with the men around, not MCPs, but <laughs> the monocyte chemoattractant protein. It causes these macrophages to come into the abdomen to make some changes, right? And I've used this slide from 2012. All of you have seen this. This is what happens. I'm not going to spend time on it. There's a jugalbandi of the chemokines and the adipokines that occurs in the abdomen. And that leads to the fat cell becoming apoptotic. When that happens, fat becomes ectopic. It goes to the liver. And from there into the pancreas and, and their islet cell inflammation occurs. We used to think that the fat cell, the pancreatic cells get destroyed. Again, I've talked about this multiple occasions, but what it really does is that the fat cell uh, decides, look, it's too uh, risky for me to continue to be, I'm sorry, the pancreatic islet cell thinks it becomes too risky for me to continue to be a pancreatic islet cell because the cost of producing insulin is so high that the beta cell is, after the cardiac myocyte, one of the most energy intensive cell. So it decides if I use consume so much energy, I'm going to die. And what it does is it de-differentiates either into a uh, alpha cell, or it de-differentiates into a gastrin-producing cell, or it just becomes a neurogenic cell, or even an acinar cell. But that's that sort of set you the background of what we knew so far about diabetes and inflammation. But let us see what 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 else is there. As I said, I'm going to talk about ancient rhythms and what better ancient uh, person to quote than Charaka. So he says, Nidhrayattam sukham dukham pushtikarsham bhalabalam vrshatakli bhata jnanam agyanam jivitam nacha. That is happiness, misery, nourishment, emaciation, strength, weakness, virility, sterility, knowledge, ignorance, life and death. All of these occur depending on proper or improper sleep. Since we are all adults, I will tell you that sex is overrated, sleep is underrated. Sleep is, 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 is one of the most satisfying experiences in the world because everything else depends on that. Right? Here is the Ratri Suptam from the Rig Veda. It's a Sanovadhyaya Yasya Vayam Yavanni Vikshmahi Vrikshena Vasanti Vaya. What is sleep? It is like, 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 the, like the tree that is calling on the birds and embraces them so that they can rest at night. Now, for many years, we did not know why sleep was necessary, right? Till this particular article, if there's one article, of, I think, of the century that people should read, this is Husserl et al. in Science in 2013. What, what, nobody knew why we needed sleep for all these thousand years. Until this one, uh, a uh, postdoc fellow learned how to put a, a mouse under a confocal microscope and allow it to sleep un in, under the whirring sound of a microscope. It takes, takes months to train a mouse, right? So what they found out was that when you sleep, your brain size shrinks to about a third. The cortices just shrink. That allow the CSF to penetrate deep and remove the toxins. Just like how in a hotel or an airport, a lot of the cleaning occurs at night. The brain cleans itself from all the dirty thoughts that you've had through the day uh, by, by going in and doing a deep clean. In fact, they showed that these endolymphs in the brain get activated. And that's why what happens in the afternoon after you've had that uh, food, let's say, and I do this all the time, I close the door in my office, we have a sofa, I would lie down, have a book in my hand, I can see the book drop down, and 20 minutes later I can hear sounds and I'm awake, and I'm much more rejuvenated. And the quick cleansing of the toxins that occur, and that's really what happens when you sleep. And when you don't do that, that's why you become crabby, crappy, uh, shout with everyone, pick up arguments, and develop diabetes. It's not just, so, but it's not just sleep. It's also the light and the lack of it. You need light, you also need the lack of light. That's the balance that nature gives. 
सो दिस इज दी अरुण प्रश्न सर्वस्वाद भुवनाद धरि तस्या पाक विशेषण दे टॉक अबाउट नॉट जस्ट लाइट बट दे टॉक अबाउट हीट पाक इज इज फायर स्मृत काल विशेषण टाइम लाइट एंड हीट डिटर्मिन द कोर्स ऑफ लाइफ एंड इट्स टाइम एंड इज डिटर्मिन बाय द सन Banshi, I should thank him for giving me opportunity to see Modera yesterday. Those of you who have not, please, the Sun Temple there—that's that's an example of our architecture. Also, the history of our, uh, the destruction of our architecture. Why are these rhythms important? It, Ken Polanski in 1988 actually showed this first. He showed loss of rhythmicity in diabetes as the first abnormality that occurs. the alpha and the beta cell are mirror images of each other and when they are not in sync that's when diabetes starts when you have circadian misalignment you have glucose intolerance when you restrict sleep besides all the crabbiness we get inflammatory markers are the ones that are up regulated cell cycle markers are up regulated there are changes in the cell cycles that occur This is a fabulous experiment, and, and I'll just tell you that this is the basis of our work also. This is Kian in 2013. What he showed in in rats was when you when you change from LD to LL a uh, DL, meaning a light dark cycle to a dark light cycle, just reverse it. Remember, rats are nocturnal feeders. These are uh, diabetes prone rats, and what he showed was that that when you uh, that what happens is that the Uh, insulin production reverses but it's not perfectly reversed that there is beta cell dysfunction and the change in the in the circadian rhythm pushes people into diabetes i always talk about this that we our economy is booming but what what cost and in fact this is something that we need to as associations start becoming advocates of that there needs to be a balance between money and health right and that's where we come in as putting mirrors in front of all the industry and the government saying look great that your young people are delivering so much but that means very soon you're going to be have a you have a country of very wealthy diabetics there are our work a few years ago showing that that very simple study we did we just did a philadelphia score and check people's hba1c and we showed that if their sleep was inadequate or of bad quality when you say sleep in, in ability to initiate ability to maintain and ability to have a certain amount to sleep that's what the psqi does that that as your sleep start went up uh, sleep scores went up your your uh, diabetes control became bad in fact there was one study that showed in the veterans affairs a few years ago that if somebody has dysomnia and you treat the dysomnia with medication say a1c becomes better in fact i still do it because i believe in this very strongly i would never use uh uh, uh hypnotic agents but i i started believing this data actually now so we did something uh, to to figure out what is really happening uh i do a lot of these cusp things because uh, i can never be uh, happy with doing some everyday work Uh, in in 2007 i started doing in vitro work and we and, and thanks to the rss di we actually published uh, so the first work on vitamin d and 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 uh, and and it's in vitro work not never done in the country before again thanks to the rss di we published the first uh, uh, gut microbiome data in the country and then uh, this is uh, our our new work uh, and i'll come to the rss di with some begging bowls soon uh, this is uh, what we what i what we saw was a lot of healthcare workers a lot of women a lot of people who work shifts have bad diabetes so i can't i can't i can't sacrifice the pancreas of women unless i'm a kapalika so we did it with rats so we got fisher rats and we had three three things one is a regular photo period which is a 12 hour light dark cycle an altered uh, photo period where we did a 12 by 12 hour uh, and we did this on alternate weeks so we reversed it on alternate weeks and the third is we put them through the nurses shift an additional 8 hour light period 6 pm to 2 am on alternate days this is brutal but i want to know tell you that our nurses go through stuff, stuff like this 
so oh, you will see that the glucose is uh, uh, the worst uh, uh, photo period had the worst glucose the worst triglycerides the worst cholesterol but i will leave you with this very interesting uh, pathological feature remember there's only 3 weeks uh, and uh, and we also looked at foxo and other things I, i i don't want to talk about it in this particular one this is a normal circadian rhythm this is a this is the islet cell perfectly normal right when you reverse the light period can you see there's an adaptive increase in the size of the islets that it's behaving like obesity i want you to know an altered circadian rhythm is exactly like how obesity does this but look at this one this is an additional 6 hours of light every alternate day the pancreatic islet cells are starting to get destroyed in the rat is enzymatic degradation can you see that the islet architecture is is altered and and bad things are happening i hope that we can take this research forward this is just the beginning of what we're doing we're writing a second grant but but this is my area of interest the presence of light and darkness and what it does to us that light for instance is going to keep as definitely affect my islet cells why is this important why is this so important it's because life has depended on the light dark cycle glucose is linked to light photosynthesis the ultimate product of photosynthesis is glucose right in plants and fungi and cyanobacteria during light uh, glucose is made during dark there is there is expenditure and and rejuvenation in humans and metazoa and the others there's a wake and a sleep cycle feeding occurs in one half sleep restoration and efficiency occurs in another half you f word it or whatever four letter word you want to use you face of consequences so we have clocks i won't spend time on it in a lack of time but these clocks are set but what we now know and i'll bring that brings to the, to the meat of uh, some of the meat of the stock is is that the mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell and we've been hearing about this including mitochondrial modulators this hydrogen ion chain is very very important this this respiratory cycle chain some amount of ros production is important because you need that proton pump leak for for nad atp ratio as, as my as my physiology teacher used to say and i think arthur gaitan also does that Uh, that what is life ultimately it is conversion of atp to adp and back that's all it does we can give fancy names to it but it's atp to adp and adp to atp right but because of this hard wiring of light and darkness there are switches glucose is a fuel for one half of the day and fatty acid oxidation is a fuel for the other half of the day right each of these inhibit the other's metabolism and they propagate their own metabolism so it is expected that by the time lipid oxidation takes place glucose oxidation does glucose uh, metabolism does not take place but at 4:30 in the afternoon if you're going to have a snack and at 8 in the after in the evening you're going to have jalebis and 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 anything else along with it glucose is going to be present always so this is called hysteresis it 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 is a metabolic memory that maintains its own metabolism i'm not going to go into the details we heard about uh, switches uh, two or three days but what we now know is the ability to switch from one fuel to another is key to human metabolism and when you don't have that ability as it occurs when both these fuels are present at the same time diabetes occurs and it it propagates it by increasing the hyperglycemia induced tissue damage i won't spend time on this but metabolic inflexibility is one of the keys to the propagation of diabetes that occurs because we are we don't respect nature's light cycle why is this important because as i said just like the sleep cleans the switch of the metabolism allows non essential cells to be removed allows important cells to be preserved and in in yeast and mice we know that the allowing this partitioning gives you longevity and that is why there's a lot of interest in fasting what are ancients interwove into our lives the ekadashi and 
and all the different fasting that was interwoven. The different kinds of foods at different times of, of the year, Chaturmasya would mean different kinds of foods, aligned with nature, they had, they had something going there. So modern science, of course, has to rediscover it, call it its own, has to package it in an American package and, and call it time-restricted eating. What the Jains and our own ancients, my, my grandmother would not eat after sunset. Right? In our temples, there was only two offerings made. Even though now you see bhog, 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 there are only two mantras. In the morning, satyam vratena prishanchami. It's all about truth. In the evening, ritam vratena prishanchami. Ritam, satyam, they're both the same. Only two offerings. And the, in the prataha and the, and the evening. But why do we eat so many times? Who knows? Right? There was no breakfast till the Brits brought it here, right? So what does time-restricted eating do? This is the animal data. Reduces cholesterol, fasting, glucose, body weight, fat, inflammation. And in, 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 in Drosophila, you'll see energy, increased energy expenditure, increased motor control, endurance, sleep, cardiac function. The, the clinical data is very mixed because I think the studies themselves are one, A, inadequate. They just extend the concept but not look at ice, uh, hypocaloric restriction. They all look at isocaloric restriction. Third, that they are not very well designed. So you will see different studies coming out in the last one or two years. Each of these having its own limitations but basically saying that yes, there are benefits and no, there are no long-term benefits. I think we need some good studies and, uh, that need to look at this. So I'm just putting this up saying that the data is sort of inadequate. The RCTs are not very conclusive. But that's not the reason I gave, I gave this oration. I, I thought I will give this connect for us to understand. And more importantly, to explore and, 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 and rediscover these sciences by using modern methodology, whether, whether it is the metabolome, the transcriptome, uh, looking at uh, these approaches and showing that we indeed come from a nation of science. So respect ancient cycles. Could be time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting. A lot of data on 5 is to 2 is very there. Exercise is a great way to restore the cycle. Ketones. Very interestingly, uh, my friend Sundar uh, Mudaliar from San Diego was telling me that uh, there is a keto drink that the Oxford team has uh, patented. And they used it for the first time last year in the two-day France. The Brits have never won Tour de France. But last year they did. That's because they, they actually had access to a ketone drink. It's not banned by the WADA, by the way. Medium chain fatty acids. They, they, you remember the, uh, how the West uh, uh, hit first, you know, this whole story about fat and they derived, deprived so many of our women of, of their pungal and other stuff. But uh, also, you know, they pushed sugar. But they also beat down any of, any of the tropical oils in favor of palm and other oils. Medium chain fatty acids, except uh, 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 as, as, not median, but medium, especially the C8. And guess where C8 and C13 come from? Coconut oil. So the Malayalis actually got it right, that you do use a bit of coconut oil. Then of course a new drug, a new class of agents called mitochondrial modulators are there. But till these are, you know, mainstream, uh, remember that uh, you get a healthy set of microbiota from your mom, her mom, her mom, her mom. It's maternally transmitted. And in C. elegans, we know that some of the epigenetic changes that, that, that are conferred on us last up to 14 generations. So you are who you are because of your nani ki nani ki nani ki nani ki nani. And that's why in the, in the Pitru Paksha, there's greater importance for the maternal side. For those of you who go to Gaya, there are 64 pindas that are kept. The vast majority is for the mother. And that's why mothers are important. And mothering is also important. So with that, uh, and a plea to not, not everything old is wonderful, not everything new is great. The smart man learns to look at each of these, evaluate them, and, and apply them in, in their care. I didn't say this, Kalidas said. So with that, thank you very much for your patience.